the Australian Financial Review. Hello, I'm James Thompson, Senior Chanticleer Columnist at the AFR. Welcome to our weekly news breakdown of all things business, finance and markets. With me today, as always, is my Chanticleer colleague and the man with an extra $300 in his pocket, it's Anthony McDonald. How are you, Anthony? Oh, please, James, don't get me started on the budget handouts and government spending our money. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, this week we will dissect the federal budget with a special guest. We'll look at BHP's titanic takeover battle and we'll look at the new fight looming over housing. But first, Anthony, while I was locked up in Parliament House on Tuesday afternoon for the federal budget, you were penning a very interesting column on how Australians spend their hard-earned. The good news is that average weekly spending is up 18% to $2,472 in the past five years. But where it's going is not going to make anyone too happy. Can you tell us about that, Anthony? Yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, the better news is that incomes are up, right? So average household income's up, I think, 796 bucks a week, which is great. But but where it's going, that's the uh, that's the blow. It's on tax, James. Ugh. Extra 222 bucks a week households are paying in tax. And um, I guess we need no reminder of that this week being budget week and the government's throwing money around like confetti and the demand for that tax dollar isn't coming down at all. So it's going on tax. It's going on more interest costs. You know, people with mortgages paying an extra on average $103 a week. It's going on depreciation and buildings, which is technically a non-cash item. It's not something we really think about in our weekly uh, household budgets, but it is still very relevant. So if you add those three things up together... Well, there's not as much left over for, you know, you just everyday things, your groceries, your entertainment, your going out, transport, all that sort of stuff, insurance. So yeah, households are feeling the squeeze was the um, conclusion. But I mean, where that tax dollar goes, I mean, that's probably going to be a big theme for us today, isn't it, James? <laughs> that's right. Yes, yes. I mean, this is data from Boston Consulting Group. Yep. Uh, am I right there, Anthony? Yep, correct. Does it tell us anything about how our spending habits might have changed over the years. You know, we, I always hear that we're spending more on services rather than stuff. Is that borne out by any of these numbers? A little bit. So yeah, so, yeah, so spending on, you know, entertainment, doing stuff out of the house was up slightly more than your traditional groceries and things sort of like inside the home, if you want to put it like that. But, yeah, the big increases, yeah, tax and interest. It's quite depressing. And James, housing's been a big part of both the federal budget and the opposition leader's budget and reply speech on Thursday night. And there's a really interesting speech on the housing market from RBA Deputy Governor Sarah Hunter. Now, did it tell us what the government's got wrong? Well, it told us, I guess, that everything's gone wrong in the housing yeah. sector all at once. And what I took, it's a really accessible, easy to understand, very clear-eyed view of the housing market, which I'd really recommend anyone who's got five minutes has a read of. What what the message is, though, is that we sort of like to think of this in very simplistic terms, you know. Uh, there's been a spurt in population growth, partly through immigration, and now there's not enough houses because lots of things have gone wrong on the supply side. So supply chains were stuffed during COVID. It's become wages have gone up. Uh, it's become a lot more expensive to build a house. All of those things are, are, are right. But what I found really interesting was that there's some demographic changes that have occurred that are really underlying all of this. And the big change is in the size of the average household in mm. Australia. So back in the middle of the 1980s, every household, and there's 11 million households in Australia at the moment, 2.8 people per household. Fast forward to now, that's down to 2.5 people. Now, that doesn't sound like a very big change, but if we were to go back to 2.8 people per household for some reason, we would need 1.2 million fewer houses wow. than we have now. So that 1.2 million figure is really interesting because that's what the government is trying to build, 1.2 million new houses over the next five years. So really, this is all about that shift in the household size. What's caused that? Well, partly it's because... The birth rate's falling, and so family sizes are smaller. Partly it's because we're all getting older, and so there's more single and couples in their later years who are you know, not living with other family members. 
And then there's COVID. So we all wanted a bit more space in COVID. So we saw share houses, that the proportion of people who live in share houses fall. Um, even working from home, the RBA reckons has been a factor here because we want to use that second or third or spare bedroom as a home office now rather than having someone live in it. So there's all these factors that have contributed to the, this fall in household size, which are actually really complex. So James, does the RBA all want to see us move back in with mum and dad or or have the kids <laughs> stay at home longer? Well, uh, uh, the interesting thing is the RBA says that these shifts are likely to be sort of permanent. Obviously, the ageing population is a permanent shift, but they even reckon the work from home shift is is pretty permanent. There was some a graph from the ABS uh, that was in the RBA speech that from the Deputy Governor Sarah Hunter that showed about 35% of us have worked from home in the last four weeks, which sounds about right. Yeah. And it, it, if you think about it, if you work from home four days or three days or even one day, you probably want to still have that space in the house where you can work from home. Um, so it does make sense that these changes are permanent, but what it means is in the short term, the response of the market is to push up rents and house prices, and in the long term, it will incentivize supply. But the problem is that supply is going to take a number of years to come through. That's the problem that the government and, and in a way, the opposition have got. So the government's got a $36 billion housing package which it says, and it rightly says, is sort of methodical, sensible, will address this uh, housing problem over time. But over time is the issue here, right? People are impatient for change in housing, and that's why you get the sort of suggestions we had from Peter Dutton on Thursday night in his budget in reply speech, which is slashing immigration, Mm. uh, which will he he reckons you can free up an extra 40,000 houses in a year by doing that. And then using, uh, letting people use first home buyers particularly use their super savings to help buy their their first house. But Anthony, there's problems with both of those, right? There are. We've got a very tight labour market. So if we restrict the migration, we risk making the the labour market even hotter, which pushes up wages, which pushes up inflation, which pushes up interest rates. But we've really got to be careful about allowing people to use their super money to jump into housing because it's got the potential to just drive up house prices even more, make houses less affordable and drive down super balances, which people are going to need when it comes time to retire. Yeah, it's exactly right, Anthony. This is the RBA's point, right? There's no quick or easy fixes here, but that will open the door to these political quick fixes that Dutton has suggested. Yeah, good points, James. Well, the budget in reply speech on Thursday night was, of course, a big focus, but the big, the main game this week, Anthony, was the budget itself. And I made the trek from Melbourne to Canberra to watch Treasurer Jim Chalmers hand down his third budget on Tuesday. And while the headline news was good, a second consecutive budget surplus, the first time we've had back-to-back surpluses in almost two decades, a wave of spending is set to plunge the budget into deficit next year, with the government's own forecasts suggesting the budget is likely to remain in the red for probably a decade. Well, to help us dissect the budget, we're thrilled to be joined for the first time on the Chanticleer podcast by the Financial Review's national editor, Jessica Gardner, who is based in Canberra and led the Finns' extensive coverage on Tuesday. Welcome to the podcast, Jess. Thank you, guys. Thanks for having me, long-time listener. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, Chalmers said he wanted to do two things with this budget, Jess, provide cost of living relief without adding to inflation and put in place the building blocks for long-term reform. Let's tackle those one by one. Um, I guess the centrepiece of the cost of living bit was $300 energy rebate for every Australian household, regardless of what you're worth or where you live. When we first got the budget documents on Tuesday afternoon in the lockup, it's fair to say the AFR team was a little shocked that this was not more targeted. Um, what do you think Chalmers was trying to do by going so big here, Jess? You're right. Uh, we were shocked uh, about the fact that this $300 per household bill relief was a Australia-wide measure from the government. Uh, often they try to keep this kind of cost of living assistance to those who need it most. And instead, as we reported on the night and in the subsequent days, rich or poor, you'll be getting uh, $300 per household. Chalmers was asked about this on the day following the budget, and he was pretty pragmatic about it and said, look, we don't have a mechanism for 
splitting who gets the $300 bill relief. It's much easier for us to just do it on a per household basis. And so his response was a a practical one. But I think the other thing to uh, remember here is that really one of the reasons for putting this household power bill relief out there is it's one of the main measures that the government and Treasury think will bring down headline inflation. And as you've discussed before, and as many in the economics community have a few questions about, yes, it will bring down headline inflation, but because it provides relief to households, will it really bring down inflation overall? Or are those second order effects of people having a little bit more money in their pocket? Does that mean they'll keep spending? I think that that stays the question on this one. Absolutely, Jess. Like you said, there's been a very mixed reaction to the idea that Chalmers will get inflation down in the short term through this $300 a household energy cost relief. But economists say in the long term, subsidies like this are inflationary. Do you think Chalmers could come to regret this if the RBA blames the government for keeping interest rates higher for longer? Yeah, you're right. That is the big gamble in this budget. We counted about $24 billion in net effects of policy decisions. So that's an extra $24 billion going into the economy as a result of decisions made by the government. And The gamble, I suppose, that Chalmers is taking here is whether or not that uh, extra money flowing into the economy stokes spending and makes it harder for the Reserve Bank to keep inflation under control. To your question, I don't think Michelle Bullock would ever be so bold as to blame Jim Chalmers um, for a rate rise. But if that (laughs) happens between now and the election, I am sure that there are some voters out there that would blame him. Yeah. But if we do get a rate rise before the election, then look out because Peter Dutton will be all over this prosecuting the claim that Labor has stuffed this up and that uh, the the last and latest interest rate rise is all down to a stimulatory budget from Jim Chalmers. What, what do you reckon, Anthony? Uh, Jess is right. Michelle Bullock is the ultimate diplomat, as all Reserve Bank governors are. How does she handle this at the next press conference when she gets 26 questions in a row? It, is the budget stimulatory? I guess she'll say it's probably not inflationary. I mean, that's what a track record suggests. But I mean, I was astonished. I, like you, you told me about it when you got out of lockup about this three hundred dollars per household. It's worth three billion dollars or whatever. I just, I couldn't believe it. I mean, and how can we go from a nine billion dollar surplus to what is it, a twenty seven billion dollar deficit? And and they're throwing around money like this. Like, it's not wartime. You know, it's not COVID. Mortgage rates are at six percent, not sixteen percent. You know, unemployment's at four point one percent. The economy's still going all right. Like I know. I know people are feeling it, but um, as for Michelle Bullock, yeah, I mean, she's going to be asked about it straight away to, at her next press conference and good luck answering it because, you know, it's got to be more money in the system. There's uh, Scrooge McDonald there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Jess, does, do, is this a vote winner out in, out in the real world, dare I say it? I think so. Most people will be pleased to hear that they're going to get $75 a quarter off their household electricity bill. And although there are many people out there who would be perplexed by the idea that this also goes to middle income and high income earners, I don't think it's the kind of thing that will get them out on the streets protesting about. They'll just kind of think, "Mm, that's a bit of a weird move, and then carry on. Yeah. I've sort of been thinking about what does 300 bucks represent? Yeah. And the, the closest thing I've got to is for lots of families, it's probably about a weekly grocery shop. Mm-hmm. And so if you're sitting there at home going, hey, this one's on Jim Chalmers, next time you go through Coles or Woolies, you're probably thinking, yeah, that's not too bad. And I don't know, does the average person worry too much about the budget deficit next year or – or the stimulatory effects of uh, of subsidies in the economy. I, I, I don't know. So, look, I think there's probably a bit of populist a populist win here potentially for Chalmers, but I, I guess time will tell. And, and these bumps tend to be pretty short term. So that's the other thing he's got to think about. I, I mentioned earlier, Jess, that there's a reform part of this budget, and, and that's that's very much focused on these tax production credits for the green hydrogen sector and the critical minerals industry for refining and processing. Now, this is all designed to uh, turn Australia into what Chalmers likes to call a green superpower over the next decade. And guess what? The resources and energy sector absolutely applauded these tax production credits that coincidentally they've been calling for for months. So 
uh, surprise, surprise, they were happy. But Jess, will this work? Uh, this is industry industry policy on a grand scale. Will it deliver or, or you know, will it flail? I think that is really hard to determine right now and remains to be seen. But you're right. There was a, a long list of companies who spoke to our Perth Resources reporter, Brad Thompson, who couldn't wait to uh, get in and say what a great job the government had done in putting out these production tax credits, which are seen uh, as a some kind of response to the US's Inflation Reduction Act. So you had Rob Scott from West Farmers, Amanda Cars from Lioness, Tony Ottaviano from Liontown, the Pilbara Minerals CEO. They were all lining up to, to applaud this measure. Mm. On the question of will it work, well, AMEC, as you mentioned, the the mining lobby that's most responsible for pushing this, has based it on a similar production credit that's applied to advanced manufacturing in the US in the Inflation Reduction Act. And it is just a 10% part of the overall money that went out to kind of clean energy ventures in the 23 financial year in, in the US. So it's hard to separate the effect of the production credit uh, away from the other things in the IRA, other tax incentives, other grants, other loans. But as you know, there has been a massive jump in clean energy investment uh, in the US as a result of the IRA. So maybe it's part of that driver. The other side of this, of course, is the hydrogen production tax incentives. And these ones seem to be designed slightly differently rather than giving you a rebate on the cost of your production for processing and refining critical minerals. Producers of green hydrogen will be given $2 for every kilo they produce. And we had one gentleman who's an entrepreneur in this space saying that he thought that it would attract a lot of foreign capital and the amount that they pay out of it would be much more than the $7 billion they'd uh, put into the forward estimates of the budget. So obviously there's some people out there who think that it will work in attracting capital, which I think is one of the key things. Jim Chalmers wanted to get out of this future Made in Australia agenda. Hmm. Anthony, as you know, when you get locked up for the budget, you get locked up about one thirty. you get let out about 7.30. In between that time, Treasurer Jim Chalmers sort of does the rounds of the Bureau, pops his head in and shakes a few hands and explains a few things. When he came to the Finns Bureau, he, he made the point that one of the things about these tax credits is that they're not direct subsidies. It's not about handing money out. Instead, it's about giving incentives to, to projects and companies that are already up and running. You have to be in production to get these tax production credits. And, you know, he said that's an example of sort of leaning on the tax system rather than handing over taxpayer dollars. I think he's got a point there. This is better than direct subsidies, isn't it? Yeah, 100%. We spoke about this on the podcast a few weeks ago. Definitely definitely better, I think, than um, investment funds or direct subsidies. But, I mean, green superpower, such a nice ring to it. But <laughs> one, and, like, and green hydrogen. But once again, it, it's that demand for energy, electricity, renewable, renewable energy is going to be so massive. Everywhere we look, you know, AI, data centers, green hydrogen, if all this is going to work, it's just going to require so much renewable energy at a time when uh, investment in new projects is has pretty much stalled. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's not necessarily going to be an easy path to get there. Now, Jess, tell us down there in Canberra, what was your biggest surprise out of the budget or what's the slow burning issue here that the rest of us should be watching? Anthony, I think the thing we really still need to keep an eye on uh, is the NDIS. Yeah. Um, as James says, uh, the ministers do pop you around into the Bureau uh, during the budget lockup, and we had Bill Shorten come in to talk about, well, to celebrate, really, he was, the fact that in the budget papers the government had put down a $14 billion saving on the NDIS over the next four years, and a lot of that is supposed to come as a result of work to stabilise the scheme. But it's work that's yet to start. And there's so many pieces that have to be locked in before we really start to see a slowdown in growth. So last year, the NDIS grew by over 20%, and it's pretty much been growing at that rate the whole time it's been in operation. And the government has a target of getting that growth rate back down to 8%. As I say, the work that needs to be done to to achieve that target is is 
is huge. Yeah. Not least of which we've got this kind of push to move kids with low level autism or developmental delay off the NDIS and instead provide that support through the education system. That's something the states need to carry the can on. They've made very little progress on that and they're already complaining about the costs. And just to give you an idea of the problem that government is facing, even though they expect to save that amount of money over the next four years, the $14 billion, Mike Reed, our economics correspondent, who's such a gun on this issue, quickly pulled out his spreadsheet once we had <laughs> access to the budget papers and was able to show me that the cost of the NDIS uh, had blown out by $5 billion compared to the last projections just in December to now the May budget. It is going to be so hard uh, to rein this in. I hope that they can for Bill Shorten's sake um, and ours, but I just I worry that there's some real heroic assumptions in that plan savings. Uh, and this is the this is the issue I, I reckon generally with the budget, right, Jess? Well, the, the surplus was built on the back of relatively short term cyclical increases in revenue. So basically, commodity prices have been much better than expected. That helps the company profits of the miners that flows through to revenue. And we've also had unemployment that's really strong. So income tax jumps up. Those are cyclical, relatively short term factors. But then we've got this massive long term structural shifts in spending. So the NDIS is one, defense is another, aged care is another, health care is another. And there's no real sort of reform in any of these areas that was shown on Tuesday night. It was, and Chalmers sort of called them unavoidable spending issues. And I get what he means, but we're sort of kicking the can down the road and saying, oh, well, we'll get to that later. Geez, we, we better hope that the iron ore price doesn't fall too far. Mm. We just couldn't have that because tax receipts would just crumble and we wouldn't want to see where that leads. Jess, thanks so much for joining us on the, on the podcast. It was great to see you on Tuesday and, and the way you marshaled the troops there was uh, nothing short of brilliant. So uh, we look forward to having you back some other time on the Chook Podcast. Thank you, James and Ant. Uh, it's been lovely to chat and I'll definitely come back and chat whenever you uh, want my insight on all things Canberra and business. Thanks, Jess. Brilliant. Thanks, Jess. For our second topic, James, it'll be a telling next few days for the biggest M&A deal in the world, which is BHP's pursuit of fellow copper and iron ore bigwig Anglo-American. Now, for those who haven't followed it, BHP has now made two bids, it's been rejected twice, and has until this coming Wednesday to get some traction with Anglo-American's board, or it'll be shut out for the next six months under the UK's truth in takeovers laws. Now, James, this is first grade standard M&A. BHP's second bid was worth $64 billion dollars. BHP CEO Mike Henry's been on the private jet to South Africa, London. He's been over in Miami this week, all trying to drum up support for the bid. BHP has five days or so to pull a rabbit out of the hat. Do you think it'll have one more crack before that May 22 deadline? Yes. I, I, I think uh, it's probably having lots of cracks behind the scenes to try <laughs> and get Anglo to the negotiating table. But I wouldn't be surprised to see one more sort of formal offer put to, yeah. put, put to Anglo. But I think this is all about what happens behind the scenes. BHP has suggested a pretty complex sort of deal. It, it wants to buy Anglo, but before it gets its hands on the bits of Anglo that it wants, it wants Anglo to demerge or, or basically get rid of two bits of the business over in South Africa, a big platinum business and a big iron ore business. And so that puts BHP in a tough little spot because – to get its deal over the line, it needs the cooperation of the Anglo board. It needs Anglo to sort of help it make its bid work. And at the moment, mm. Anthony, Anglo's board just does not want to play ball. In fact, they're actively uh, trying to block BHP's advances. You know, that they've rejected them twice. And, and, th and this week we saw Anglo come out with its own plan to break itself up and, you know, try and get shareholders excited about that. So th this is the problem. Um, the Anglo board just won't play ball and ultimately BHP needs to needs it to. But, Anthony, we, we can get a bit carried away with M about M&A in the media because we love the, 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 the conflict that's involved in M&A. Um, and it gives us plenty to write about. But but why is this deal important? Yeah, James, look, I've been as guilty as anyone as talking up the importance of deals <laughs> um, just generally. 
over the past decade. But no, this one, this one is important because we're talking about the future of BHP, which if nothing else is Australia's biggest taxpayer. Yeah. You know, I think it, I think it paid about nearly, I don't know, $10 billion in tax uh, a year. So, I mean, more than half of its earnings still come from iron ore, right? The Pilbara, it's a fantastic business, but it wants to sort of get more into these future-facing commodities. That's been the strategy for the past few years now. Copper is a big part of that. Now, copper's already 30 to 40% of its earnings, but it wants to add a bit more. Anglo-American brings copper, it brings met coal, which is the coal that's used to make steel, um, has some good mines up in Queensland. So for BHP, it's sort of about, it's about reshaping the portfolio. It's about making the portfolio ready for the coming 10, 20 years. And I mean, BHP, if you look at it in the past decade, it's done quite a bit of restructuring already. It's got out of petroleum. It's out of a lot of the bitsy stuff. It sort of rolled that out into South 32, which is now a separately listed company. And it's really been going off hard after copper. So we saw it buy Oz Minerals here in Australia for about $10 billion last year. It's uh, getting bigger into potash. It's developing its own projects there. Anglo also has potash with this Woodsmith um, project. So it's really trying to diversify those earnings just from the, the iron ore cash cow into other things. So, 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 Anthony, the logic's good. Yeah. Anglo has been a bit of a basket case. Yep. I, I would have imagined or we all thought that they would love it if a white knight like BHP came along. Certainly their shareholders would. So why has BHP struggled to gain traction? What, why hasn't Mike Henry been allowed in the Anglo boardroom? Well, it's, it's a good question, James, because I think you've said a couple of times in your columns that, yeah, six months ago, England, Anglo-American was all over the shop and uh, it was desperately crying out for something like this. Yeah. But in the background, I mean, they've been, they've been working up their own strategy reset. So the, the whole thing now has come down to, all right, should Anglo shareholders back management to pull out that strategy reset or should they actually go with BHP and trust for BHP to do it? But I mean, the reason why you or I should care about this, James, is pretty simple. We've got both of us, all of our listeners in Australia, we've got heaps of BHP exposure, right? Yeah. Like in, in just through our super funds. Um, I think Australian super has six or seven billion dollars worth of BHP shares. If you're in Australian retirement trust like me, they've got another two or three billion dollars worth, right? So it's it's uh it's hugely important. It's everywhere. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if if BHP doesn't get Anglo this round, James, do you think it matters? I mean, does it tarnish the CEO Mike Henry's legacy, does it does it change the way they do anything? Not sure, Anthony. I think for BHP, they say Anglo is a nice to have rather than a must have. So they don't feel any pressure to do this deal. They think it's good value. They'd like to get their hands on it. But I don't think it tarnishes Henry's legacy if he can't get it. BHP's already got the world's biggest copper reserves yep. in its portfolio at the moment. So it could go on quite happily you know, developing those over the next five decades, no problems. There probably is a chance, Anthony, that Henry's legacy is tarnished if he overpays for Anglo. Oh, if he time. tries, to, if he if he stretches himself too far, mm. the, the history of mining deals in the last thirty years is pretty putrid. Generally, miners overpay; they get themselves in trouble. The deals don't work out. The, what 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 looked like a fantastic deal at the start turns out to be a bit of a stinker as time goes on and the the miners have to deal with the assets and commodity markets change. So Mike Henry's mantra since he got the job in, in 2020 has always been about discipline. And he is he, he's been disciplined about the way he's returned capital to shareholders. He's been very disciplined about improving BHP's operations, making the company more efficient. Um, and, and so he doesn't want to let that discipline slip here. And he's promising that he won't be doing that. He's saying, you know, I will not overpay for this thing. And so that's that's the only way to me he could really tarnish his legacy. If he if he stretches too far for Anglo and, and, and it all goes wrong down the track, then we'll look back at Mike Henry's uh, period and say, it was pretty good if only he hadn't overpaid for Anglo. So I think that's the thing he's very wary of. 
Yeah, that's a great point, James. Like just history says, BHP has been as guilty as anyone of this, is that miners generally buy things in the good times. And yeah. it's a very cyclical industry. So they buy in the good times, which tends to be the top top of the cycle. They they try that try these things, spend billions of dollars. Often then the cycle cycle turns and they're left with egg on their face, destroy billions of dollars of shareholders' money, and it's just tended to end really poorly. Yeah, it's funny though, Anthony. We've we've sort of been saying uh, you know, I don't want to keep coming back to the budget, but Peter Dutton had a line in his speech last night where he said, energy is the economy. Yeah. And, and and we've been talking about this in the last couple of weeks, how if you look through the, the green transition, the AI boom, it all comes back to the ability to electrify the economy and, and how much energy can we produce? Can we produce enough energy? Can it be clean enough? This deal speaks exactly to those things. Yeah. This is all about copper. Copper's at the heart of the renewable energy transition. It's at the heart of the AI boom. We need more copper. We need it faster. And so this is why th this deal is really important. This is why BHP, even though it's got the world's biggest copper reserves, wants to go even faster in copper. I mean, I think copper hit 10000 bucks a tonne uh, this week, partly because there's a bit of a short squeeze going on. But there's barely a hotter sector in the world. And it's interesting to see these things keep coming together. AI, green transition, you know, the, the budget sort of green superpower thing all comes back to copper and, and BHP at Anglo is right at the heart of it. Yeah. Well, Anthony, let's take a break. And But speaking of mining and copper and all those exciting energy transition themes, let's come back after the break and talk about our mining summit in Perth. Welcome back. If you want to know more about what we're talking about today and a whole lot more, AFR subscribers can sign up to the Chanticleer newsletter at join.afr.com forward slash Chanticleer. Every Friday, the newsletter pulls together the best Chanticleer columns from the week and the best bits of this podcast and delivers them to your inbox. All right, Anthony, a uh, few things to note next week. Tuesday, consumer confidence. This is a big data point, right? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to this one. Everything we're seeing from the retailers, whether that's Dan Murphy's owner, Endeavor, JB Hi-Fi, Coles, and there's been some downgrades too from the likes of Baby Bunting. They're all telling us that con the consumer's softening, they're trading down for value. There's a bit of uh, weakness there. I mean, obviously the treasurer thinks we all need our 300 bucks too. So <laughs> it'll be, um, yeah, I imagine that consumer confidence is on the way down. Yes, no, a good, good call. Uh, Wednesday, as we said, is uh, D-Day for BHP's Anglo bid, but coincidentally, in a beautiful stroke of timing, mm. we'll be holding the AFR Mining Summit for the second year running in Perth. This is going to be fun, Anthony. We've got uh, the Resources Minister, Madeline King, who after the announcement of those production cuts for critical minerals, I expect she's going to be chaired into the uh, summit <laughs> on the shoulders of the mining industry. Um the miners, particularly in nickel and lithium, have had a pretty tough start to the year. Do you think their smiles might be uh, returning to faces now? Returning a little bit. I mean, it's heading in the right direction. But quite interesting when you look at the agenda. I mean, the top four or five things are all critical minerals, right? And I think iron ore doesn't really get a mention till later in the, later in the afternoon. And I guess that it shows you what every, where everyone's looking at the moment. And like like we said, even BHP, they're they're trying to get into copper, but um. You'll you'll be there for us, James Summits Thompson. Um, <laughs> yeah, you got a you're doing a panel, aren't you? Yeah, doing a panel. Uh, got some uh, some great mix of uh, investors and people in the nickel industry, and so I'm really looking forward to seeing how sort of both sides of the capital market coin are thinking about this um, th these troubles in in critical minerals. Be fascinating to see. Anthony, uh, we mentioned last week how important the US CPI data on Thursday morning was going to be, and we got a pleasant surprise. It was a bit softer than the market expected. Mm. Um, equities rallied. Uh, the ASX had its best day in 19 months on Thursday. And so everybody thinks that rate hikes are perhaps off the table now. Yeah. Focus is back on the cuts, isn't it? It's yeah. amazing, how, amazing what a week in markets can do. But these these calls, I mean, it really is what's driving those markets from that macro level, whether whether we're having down weeks or up weeks. Yeah, and of course we get uh, Reserve Bank Governor uh, Michelle Bullock speaking to us 
uh, once every six weeks at a at a press conference after the rate decision. Uh, the Federal Reserve is a much bigger body. Uh, yeah. It's basically made up of individual Fed presidents for different states. There are 12 separate speeches from oh, Fed wow. officials next week, <laughs> including one from Jerome Powell. Will we learn anything about rates or will we hear the sort of Michelle Bullock or it could go either way type line? Oh, probably the latter could go either way, but I, I feel for your sleep patterns. I mean, that's a lot of speeches to be tuning into next week, James. No, no, I'll be happy to read the summaries, I think, particularly from Perth. All right, we love questions here at the uh, Chanticleer podcast, and we've got a question today from Ben from Perth. If you've got one you want to send in, you can email us at chanticleer at afr.com. You can also send us a question in audio form, as Ben's done. Just record a voice memo on your phone, include your name and where you're from, and Email it to us. Let's hear from Ben. Hey, Chooks. My name is Ben. I'm a big fan of the podcast. I'm based in Perth and I'm in my late 20s working in the financial planning industry. I entered this industry in early 2020 before COVID and I've only ever been exposed to the current regulatory environment. The Haynes Royal Commission, or otherwise the Banking Royal Commission, which started in 2017 and concluded in 2019, brought among significant reforms to the industry. These changes completely upended and professionalized the industry for the better, in my opinion. In the Commission, the compensation scheme of last resort was established, which charges the industry for the misconduct of bad actors in the field. You'd be familiar with the collapse of Dixon Advisory. My question to you is, what do you think about the industry being footed with the $65 million bill payable to clients and suppliers of Dixon Advisory, equating to about $5,700 per advisor? How is this fair? And why am I expected to pay for the wrongdoings of bad actors in the space that were operating before I had ever even entered the profession? Do any other industries do this? Many thanks, guys. Love the show. Well, uh, it's a great question, Ben. And, and mm. the immediate answer is yes, other industries do this. Um, the, the, the raising of levies from industries uh, to basically pay for their own regulator is is a pretty common practice in Australia and around the world. But Anthony, I, I do get Ben's point here. He's part of the new guard of the financial advice sector, yeah. extensively trained, done all the work. Um, sounds like he's exactly what we want an advisor, professional, diligent, highly educated. Um, and it must be galling to see, you know, a, a fair chunk of change going to pay for uh, the bad actors in your sector. But I guess this is part of being in a profession that this is part of the overall incentive for the profession, right? The idea of this compensation scheme of last resort and getting the industry to fund it is hopefully that it encourages, enforces those new higher standards the industry needs to act under. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, real real kick in the guts uh, for someone like Ben. But yeah, unfortunately, it's not unique to financial advice. I mean, if you look at the banks, for instance, there's been a bit of attention recently on how much the mortgage writers inside the banks can uh, can earn and their bonus, the size of their potential bonuses has been crimped as well, you know, because of poor behavior of people that came before them. So unfortunately, um, yeah, that's, that's the way these things sort of go. But I mean, it can't be helping the financial advice sector, no. right? So that the number of financial advisors in Australia has nearly halved in the past five years. There's now now about fifteen and a half thousand financial advisors. Now a lot of industries are going through a tough time, but the problem is that Australia's retirement savings are through the roof, wealth's through the roof. We've got the aging population. We need financial advice more than ever. And when you have legacy yeah. issues overhanging the industry like this and like for people like Ben at a time when the industry is trying to attract people, it can't help at all. So what do you do, James? I guess you've got to find a way, don't you, to stem those losses and, and make sure that they're not keeping people like Ben out at a time we really need them. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. Uh, and, and, and Ben, we, we need more Bens in the industry. So hopefully, uh, as Anthony says, we, we can get more advisors and and which I help, I guess helps spread the load of that compensation scheme cost also. Well, Anthony, thanks for a big week. Thanks to uh, Jess for joining us on the podcast too. I'll uh, I'll bring you back some good stories from the wild wild west. Yeah, thanks, James. If 
you like the podcast and you want to hear more, consider sharing or giving the podcast a review as it helps other listeners find us. And don't forget to follow wherever you get your podcasts. At The Financial Review, we investigate the big stories about markets, business and power. For more, go to AFR.com and you can subscribe to The Financial Review, the daily habit of successful people at AFR.com slash subscribe. Chanticleer was hosted by me, James Thompson and Anthony MacDonald with special guest Jessica Gardner. It was produced by Alex Gow and Lap Fan. Our theme is by Alex Gow. The executive producer is Fiona Buffini. The Australian Financial Review.